Bonjour à tous, je m'appelle Robert Primavesi, je suis le vice-doyen du programme prédoctoral de la Faculté de médecine de l'Université McGill. J'aimerais vous souhaiter le bienvenu à notre cérémonie 2015, uh, Donning the Healer's Habit. Good morning everyone, my name is Robert Primavesi. I'm the Associate Dean of Undergraduate Medical Education at McGill University, the Faculty of Medicine. And I'd like to extend you a warm welcome to our 2015 Donning the Healer's Habit ceremony. We will begin uh, this morning's program with a musical prelude by E. Medici, uh, de McGill String Quartet. Nous allons commencer la cérémonie avec un prélude uh, musical de Quatuor E. Medici de McGill. Je vous prierai donc de fermer vos téléphones cellulaires, vos pagettes, et aussi de ne pas prendre des photos durant la cérémonie. Un photographe professionnel prendra des photos de chaque étudiant au moment où il recevra son sarron blanc. Les photos seront disponibles gratuitement pour les étudiants including DVD to the ceremony. I would ask you to turn off your cell phones and pagers or put them to vibrate. I would also request you refrain from taking photos during the ceremony. A professional photographer will take pictures of each student as they uh, receive their white coat, and photographs and a DVD of the ceremony will be available free of charge to the students um, after the uh, event through the events office. This is the uh, 15th white coat ceremony and the E. De Medici de McGill String Quartet has been privileged to perform at all of them. The quartet is composed of members of the E. Medici de McGill Orchestra. The ensemble is now in its 27th season and counts some 70 members. With 200 performances of symphonic music for the community, the university, and the faculty, including three recent performances at the opening of the MUHC Glen site, it adds a special social dimension to medical education and to the profession. It is also a unique outreach program of the Faculty of Medicine into the community. Everybody's invited to Imbedici's fall concert on November 15th. To introduce the uh, musicians, Jennifer Kim on violin is an undergraduate student of anatomy and cell biology at McGill University and hopes to be a medical student. <laughs> Dr. Michael Stern on violin is a retired member of McGill University's Office of Technology Transfer and Concert Master of E. Medici. <laughs> Dr. Ante Pagin on viola is Professor of Pharmacology and Therapeutics at McGill University's Faculty of Medicine. He's the founder and director of E. Medici de McGill, as well as a violist in the orchestra. Philip Rafales on cello is executive director at Elio Center, a nonprofit organization engaged in promotion of sustainable energy policies. The program for this morning, 
Okay, I'll let you clap. <laughs> the uh, program for this morning is Antonin Dvorak's first movement to the string quartet number 12, so-called The American.
So, bienvenue aux étudiants de la classe de 2018, à leurs familles et à leurs amis. C'est un grand moment pour tous ceux qui ont contribué à la formation de ces futurs médecins. To the students of the class of 2018, families and friends, welcome to the dawning of the Healer's Habit Ceremony. This is a very proud moment for everyone who has contributed to getting these students to where they are today. This event was relocated to New Residence Hall from the McIntyre Medical Building last year, and this allows us to fit everybody into one room. The proceedings are being videotaped and are available uh, on online by live video streaming for those who could not be with us today. I would like to acknowledge a special group of faculty members who are here in attendance today, the Oster Fellows for the class of 2018. Named in honor of the great McGillian teacher, Sir William Osler, the Oster Fellows represent some of the faculty of medicine's best teachers. They have been assigned to tutor and mentor groups of six students from the very first day of medical school through graduation. I'd like the Oster Fellows, as well as Dr. Barry Slapkoff, director of the Oster Fellow Program, to stand so we can acknowledge their contributions to the education of these students. First-time Oster Fellows will receive a copy of William Osler to Oster Fellows, uh, an address in Sir William Osler's hand. For the students of the class of 2018, the donning of the white coat marks your transition from layperson to professional. The new, MDC the, the new MDCM curriculum is offered the class of 2018 an early exposure uh, to clinical experiences from the very first day of medical school unprecedented in the history of medicine at McGill and unrivaled anywhere else in Canada. The longitudinal family medicine experience has provided the class of 2018 with a combined 18,000 patient encounters and allowed them to perform 12,000 physical examinations over the course of their first year. This year, you will continue your clinical experience to the Community Alliance, Health Alliance Project, CHAP, which will expose you to vulnerable populations in Montreal. In January, you will take your studies of medicine from the classroom to the hospitals, to the bedsides of your patients. This is where you will learn and practice medicine for the rest of your careers. So really, most you said, the student begins with the patient, continues with the patient, ends his studies with the patient, using books and lectures as tools, as a means to an end. By donning your white coat, you accept to provide the highest standards of ethical care to your patients as individuals and to meet the wellness needs of society. You make this commitment in front of your peers, your families, and your friends. It's a big responsibility, but one that you have studied long and hard to achieve, and a responsibility for which we are confident you are ready. I would like to invite uh, Dr. David Eidelman, Vice Principal Health Affairs and Dean of the Faculty of Medicine to address the class. Je viendrai inviter maintenant Dr. David Eidelman, vice principal santé et affaires médicales et doyen de la faculté de médecine, à s'adresser la classe de 2018. Thank you very much, Dr. Primavesi. So, welcome to the class of 2018, to your family and friends. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue. Ce n'est pas seulement en tant que doyen, mais en tant que médecin et aussi en tant que diplômé de cette école, j'ai la, la grande honneur de, de m'adresser à vous, la classe de 2018, et à vos invités. Before I begin, I would like to personally welcome and thank Dr. Danielle Ofri from Bellevue Hospital Center, New York, and NYU. Bellevue is the oldest uh, public hospital in the United States, and we're very privileged to have her as today as our keynote speaker. She's an acclaimed author and speaker, and particularly renowned, I'm told, for her storytelling and aversion to PowerPoint, it says here. So we'll see what that's about in a moment. <laughs> we look very much to hearing from her. Uh, I would like to express my deep appreciation to Dr. Donald Boudreaux, uh, who initiated and has sustained this event over its 15 years. And I would also like to thank Ann Briggs and her team uh, for their hard work at organizing it. Uh, this white coat ceremony was initially launched in 2001. We're now uh, in 2015, so that's a, quite an accomplishment. Now. 
Uh, when I think back, you know, think about white coat ceremony, I think back to my own experience as a medical student, and of course there was no such thing as a white coat ceremony. It was 1976, things were very different. Many of us had come back to school uh, in the fall after having uh, spent part of our summer working at the Olympics. Uh, I know for young people, the Olympics are just a place where we wasted a lot of money. <laughs> but I want you to know that med students from uh, Université de Montréal and McGill had a very important role in the Olympics. Uh, we had very glamorous jobs. We were, we were urine collectors. <laughs> so we ran around collecting samples of urine for, for doping testing. And, and the cool part about that was because we had to follow the athletes after events, we had passes that allowed us to go anywhere. We could go to the Olympic Village or we could go to the press gallery, which was, which was very cool. But, and at that time, getting started in clinical work was much less cool. We, we got white coats, of course, but we didn't get a ceremony. And most days, in those days, most things just happened. You, uh, you didn't get a formal recognition that your lives were un undergoing really a profound change. Uh, we were told where to show up. We picked up our coats and we got, did our work. And as good baby boomers, we did as we were told. We didn't ask too many questions. We knew, in fact, that doctors wore white coats. And uh, since we were going to be doctors, I guess it made sense for us to get white coats also. Aujourd'hui, cependant, nous sommes engagés dans un événement qui marque une transition importante dans votre vie et dans l'évolution de votre carrière en tant que futur médecin. As you know, the donning of your white coat is symbolic because under, especially under the new curriculum, you wear them from the first year as a part of your early exposure to family medicine. So of course, you, somebody told me, but I already have a white coat. The purpose of this is really to signify the transition that you're making and that you will make in the second year where you begin to assume some responsibility for your patients, for the patients that you see, and that's, that's the key issue. Alors, vos blouses, ils sont courtes. Il est de coutume pour les étudiants de porter des blouses courtes jusqu'à ce qu'ils obtiennent leur diplôme. C'était la même chose dans mon temps. Vous allez noter que ces sarraux sont fonctionnels. Ils protègent les vêtements. De plus, leurs poches sont utiles pour porter vos équipements et vos collations. Aside from these obvious conveniences, the white coat reminds us of the attire worn by priests and shamans in various cultures throughout history, a vestment specially reserved for the healer. Of course, physicians didn't always wear white coats, and many don't wear them today. They were adopted more than a century ago by physicians seeking to emphasize the link of our profession to the sciences, and the white coat, you know, the scientist's white coat became the symbol of the practicing physician. The use of white coats at times has been criticized as separating the healer from his or her patient, not to mention as acting as a vector for infection. But nevertheless, there's evidence to suggest that white coats, that patients prefer their patients specially clothed in a white coat. Like in those traditional societies, we expect our healers to be somehow special, at least while exercising their healing function. And this is why the white coat ceremony is actually formally called, as you can see on your programs covered, the dawning of the healer habit ceremony. While we share much with tra traditional healers of the past, we wear our white coats with pride because doctors now are indeed healers and not the mystics and harbingers of dooms or imposters that they sometimes were in days of old. We're fortunate to live in an age of evidence-based medicine of the application of science to healing. Modern day doctors work hand in hand with scientists and indeed, they are often one and the very same person, and so they typically share the same attire. So in putting on this coat today, you are marking the transition from first-year student to professional. The coat conveys professional responsibilities that you will carry out throughout your entire clinical career. This is symbolism of a, a very high order. Donning is the white coat is the first step to becoming the, the outstanding doctor that you will one day be. While today you don a physical coat, during your career you will adapt your appearance to the demands of the specific paths you choose. The white coat and how it will be used is a way, is in, in this way a reflection of the person uh, wearing it. It's a reflection of you. And as a family doctor, your white coat might be accompanied by a stethoscope. Uh, for some specialties, the white coat will probably be left hanging on the office door. Pediatricians rarely wear them and psychiatrists almost never do. But the white coat symbolism is no less potent for all that. It has been called an emblem of trust that you must earn from patients. And we have every confidence in you that you can and will earn that trust. 
With every interaction with every patient, over the days and years of your professional lives, you will maintain the enduring, enduring appeal of the white coat as a symbol of hope and healing. Although the putting on of a white coat is a simple act, it is a meaningful moment for you and for those close to you. To get to this place and to this point in time has required extraordinary effort on your part. And of course, it's required the support of your friends and family, some of whom are here today. Remember that this is a moment of great pride for them, too. You're fulfilling the hopes and dreams they have invested in you. And to all those families and friends, I say thank you and <laughs> applause. Alors, futur médecin, au nom de la faculté de médecine, je vous félicite. I want to wish you the best on your next steps of your journey, starting, of course, with next week's anatomy exam. <laughs> and without further ado, I'm going to turn the, the, the podium back to Dr. Primavesi. Thank you very much. Notre uh, conférencière principale est Dr. Danielle Ofri. It is a great pleasure that I introduce keynote speaker Dr. Danielle Ofri. Uh, Danielle Ofri, MD, PhD, is an associate professor of medicine at New York University School of Medicine, but her clinical home is at Bellevue Hospital. She's a founder and editor in chief of the Bellevue Literary Review. Her newest book is What Doctors Feel How Emotions Affect the Practice of Medicine. Danielle Ofri is the author of three other books about life in medicine. Medicine in Transition, Incidental Findings, and Singular Intimacies, Becoming a Doctor at Bellevue. She is also editor of a medical textbook, The Bellevue Guide to Outpatient Medicine, which won a Best Medical Textbook Award. Danielle Ophi writes regularly for the New York Times about medicine and doctor-patient relationship. Her essays have also appeared in the Los Angeles Times, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, Slate, The New, the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, CNN, and National Public Radio. Her essays have been selected twice for Best American Essays and also for Best American Science Writing. She's a recipient of the McGovern Award from the American Medical Writers Association for preeminent contributions to medical communication. Danielle Ofri lives with several unfinished novels in various states of disrepair under her bed, <laughs> three kids, an aging lab mutt, and the forever challenges of the cello in a singularly intimate Manhattan-sized apartment. Danielle Ofri. Thank you, Dr. Freeman Bessie, Dr. Edelman. It's a pleasure to be back at my alma mater. Um, I spent many, many hours sleeping in the McIntyre Medical Building and many hours in the anatomy and neuroanatomy labs, but as an undergraduate. And when I got to NYU School of Medicine, I was the only McGill graduate. And we did our first year studies. The joke was I'd already done it all in my undergraduate uh, here at McGill. Um, but it's too early in your career for me to put you to sleep with PowerPoint. So instead, I'll start with a story from from Bellevue Hospital. Which one would she be? I hovered by the door to the Bellevue Hospital emergency room, my eyes darting from one patient to the next. As a first-year medical student whose entire career thus far had existed inside cavernous, windowless lecture halls, the chaos of the ER terrified me. Three months earlier, I'd signed up to be a volunteer rape crisis counselor at Bellevue. Each morning, the beeper was passed from one student volunteer to the next. Did you get called? We asked each other, all nervously excited. The very act of carrying a beeper, of being potentially responsible for someone, made us all terrified and thrilled. At 3 o'clock in the morning, one night, a beeper went off for the first time ever in my life. And of course, never stopped. <laughs> I frantically pulled on my clothes and I ran down First Avenue in the darkness to the hospital. And now, standing by the door, peering into this bizarre hive of activity, I fought to settle my jangling nerves. How would I find her? What would I say to her? What exactly qualified me, whose expertise was limited thus far to the pentose phosphate shunt, what qualified me to be in this role as a caregiver? I found a charge nurse who scanned the clipboard and pressed the eraser end of a pencil to the corner of her lips. Josephine Hamlin, she said, that's yours. She inclined the pencil toward a disheveled black woman a few feet away. 
GYN's already been here, just needs to get cleaned up. The woman was clearly homeless, with shaggy, matted hair and dirt-encrusted clothing of indeterminate color. The weather-beaten cragginess of her face obscured her age. Her desolate eyes stared vacantly out into space. She sat hunched on the stretcher, her gaunt legs drooping toward the floor, feet stuffed into unlaced, unlaced construction boots without socks. Gingerly, I took several steps toward her. As I drew closer, a pungent odor enveloped me, the smell of unwashed bodies and moldering clothes. I vowed to press forward, despite the nausea that was gathering at the back of my throat. And then a faint movement near her shoulder caught my eye, and I froze in my spot as a roach emerged from a fold in her threadbare sweater and sauntered placidly down her arm. It hesitated midway and then rounded her elbow, disappearing back into a layer of clothing. I stood horrified, clenching my stomach. But I knew that I had to swallow it all back, that I had to continue my approach toward this woman. This is what I'd signed on for when I enrolled in medical school, to help patients in need, no matter who they were or what they looked like or what they smelled like. Wasn't that what the Hippocratic Oath was written for? Yet my body refused to move. The fetid smell capped by the appearance of a God-fearing New York City roach was just too much for me. I could tell that she hadn't seen me yet, that there was still time to hide. And so I inched backwards until I reached the triage desk and could squeeze my inadequacy safely behind the Formica counter. What on earth was I going to do? This was my patient. This was a human being who had just been violated in the most horrible of manners. My job was to go there and help her. This is what being a doctor meant, right? Yet all I could do was cringe behind the desk, gutlessly pretending to do paperwork. A few minutes later, a nurse's aide, an older Haitian woman, she approached the patient. The aide reached out and took the patient's hand in hers. She spoke softly and I watched as she coaxed the patient's hand, coaxed the patient's gaze upwards toward hers. The aide reached out her other hand and gently smoothed the patient's stiff, tangled hair. Slowly, the patient stood, listing slightly to the left. The aide stepped in closer, supporting the woman as they began walking toward the shower room, their heads nearly touching. As they passed the triage desk, I could hear the aide's encouraging voice. You'll feel so much better after a shower, and we can get you some clean clothes. The aide's arm was secure around the woman's shoulder. I know a quiet place where you can rest afterwards, she said. Don't worry, I'll stay with you. I remained hidden behind the desk, awed and humbled. As her distance from me grew and the potent stench concomitantly receded, I could finally exhale. I sank back into the chair, realizing just how much I needed to learn about medicine. Professionalism and patient-centered care these are two of the biggest buzzwords of medicine today, and you'll hear them everywhere. They turn up in the hospital mission statement, the medical school curriculum. There are now core competencies on these and official charters about these. I'm sure they will be drilled into your head, somewhere between the pathophysiology of alveolar hemorrhage and the phone numbers for radiology and Chinese takeout. <laughs> and I'm heartened, I am, that these ideas are at the forefront of medical discourse these days. But they are only new names for very ancient concepts. The Oath of Maimonides, which is recited by many graduating medical classes, states, may I never see it in the patient anything but a fellow creature in pain. Now, it's not actually clear whether this famous oath was in fact written by Maimonides, the 12th century uh, physician and Jewish philosopher, or whether it was actually penned by an 18th century German doctor, Marcus Hertz, who himself was the personal physician of another famed Jewish philosopher, Moses Mendelssohn. You know, my grandmother, Gertrude Edelman, was also a Jewish philosopher of some renown. And she used to say that all religions have opinions on the ethical issue of when life begins. But in the Jewish faith, there is consensus. The embryo is not viable until it graduates medical school. <laughs> And I know this is common in many different ethnic groups. 
But whoever actually wrote the Oath of Maimonides just about captured it all in that succinct statement, may I never see in the patient anything but a fellow creature in pain. And when this is the overriding precept of medicine, then professionalism, patient-centered care, and all the other catchwords of the day will follow suit. It is strikingly simple, but also, as I learned as a first-year medical student that day in the ER, devastatingly difficult. So how do we learn this ability? None of this conveys well in our typical ways of teaching, PowerPoint presentations, other than sounding like well-meaning platitudes. And I think that most students here, and most patients for that matter, can distinguish quite clearly when medical care is focused squarely on the patient, as opposed to the needs of the staff or the hospital or the insurance company. I think they know right away when the behavior of the doctor is professional and ethical, and they surely know when it's not. As the American Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart famously said about pornography, you know it when you see it, and of course you know it when it's not. And I knew it when I saw it that day in that nurse aide in the Bellevue Hospital emergency room those many years ago, even though I'd only been in medical school for three months and there hadn't been a single lecture about professionalism, or maybe there was and maybe I slept through it or I was working on 19 down in the New York Times crossword puzzle. But that nurse aide embodied the idea that the best teachers of medicine are the ones who walk the walk rather than talk the talk. Her act of compassion left me breathless as I cowered behind the desk. I knew that she was smelling the same stink that I had smelled, seeing the same grime and wretchedness. Yet, she stepped forward without any evident hesitation. Not only did she step forward, but she gave of herself to the patient. In that moment, she personified for me what it meant to be a caregiver. Her visceral lesson in empathy resonated more powerfully and more authentically than any lecturer, charter, core competency or mission statement that I've ever been party to. And yes, we should of course talk explicitly about medical professionalism and patient-centered care. But none of these words will convey the basic precepts of medicine the way a true role model will. The realities of paperwork and insurance companies and administrative oversight often handily overwhelm doctors these days. And the true goals of medicine can get lost in the bureaucratic shuffle. But inspiration can come from all around us. Remember, it's not just your professors or your attendings or the New England Journal of Medicine who are your teachers. There are teachers all around us, nurses, patients, orderlies, aides, technicians, family members, and even occasionally the suits, the administrators. Keep your eyes open, your ears open, and your mind open, and you can learn a lot. And I'll close with a quote from one of my favorite poems, Gaudiamus Igator by John Stone. John Stone was a poet and cardiologist who unfortunately passed away a few years ago from um, Emory College, and he wrote this poem as a, graduate, uh, as a commencement speech for a graduating class of medical students, who I think don't, didn't realize just how fortunate they were. Um, Gaudiamus Igator is Latin for, therefore let us rejoice, something we should be doing lots of today. And there are legions of quotable lines from his poem, but I'll just give you one. For you will learn to see most acutely out of the corner of your eye, to hear best with your inner ear. And this is what that nurse aide did. While everyone else was blind to this patient's suffering, deaf to her silent cries, this nurse aide beheld the patient with the gaze so steady, I was staggered. I'll never know that nurse aide's name. She was probably squeaking by on minimum wage, and I'm sure she never got Teacher of the Year award from the dean's office but I am forever in her debt for teaching me this powerful lesson about what taking care of patients really means. And so I'll give you Dr. Stone's advice one more time so you can take it with you. For you will learn to see most acutely out of the corner of your eye, to hear best with your inner ear. And these are the ways that poets view the world. And we as physicians, and now these ranks will soon expand to the 12 rows in the beginning here. We can all become more astute, more perceptive, more connected physicians if we learn a bit from the poets. Thank you very much and good luck.
Melanie Bernstein, membre de la classe de 2016, a reçu son sort en blanc il y a deux ans. Elle est maintenant en quatrième année. Melanie va partager avec nous ses réflexions des deux, des deux dernières années. I met Melanie Bernstein uh, for the first time in September of her first year when I organized a teaching session for senior emergency medicine residents uh, on giving feedback and teaching procedures, and Melanie volunteered to play the part of a real medical student. Uh, now in her fourth and final year, Melanie most recently completed her clerkship in emergency medicine at the Montreal General Hospital where I work. I know that we share a passion for medical education and emergency medicine, and I'm eager to hear her reflections on her journey in medicine. Melanie Bernstein. Dean Adelman, Associate Dean Primavesi, Assistant Dean Gupta, keynote speaker and honored guest, Dr. Ofri, Physician Apprenticeship Director, Dr. Slapkoff, distinguished faculty, guests, and of course, the class of 2018. My name is Melanie, and I am honored to have the opportunity to speak with you at such an important ceremony. Just two short years ago, I was in your place, surrounded by my loved ones, and what a special day it was. The coats you're receiving today are white and crisp. When I received my white coat, I remember being terrified of getting it dirty. It shone so brightly. However, looking at my coat now, it's no longer very white at all. Truth be told, my white coat has many stains, creases, and even a few tears. While some might think my coat simply needs a really good washing, and I'm here to tell you that there is so much more that, to those visual imperfections than meets the eye. In fact, the truth is that the impact of each stain, crease, and tear goes far beyond the thickness of the coat. Behind each one, there is a story, an experience, a patient who I had the opportunity to touch and who had the opportunity to touch me. I would like to share some of those experiences with you this morning. The first stain I got was from carrot puree soup, and it was during my second week of clerkship. I was doing my internal medicine rotation at the old Royal Vic. My very first patient was an older lady who had come in for what was supposed to be a routine procedure, only to find out that she had advanced pancreatic cancer. I liked Mrs. G. She was really sweet, but had a surprisingly dirty sense of humor, and she always managed to crack me up when I went to check on her. One day, I went into her room and found her struggling to use her cutlery during lunch. She was becoming so weak so quickly. It was difficult to watch. Even though I was feeling overwhelmed by the million other things I had to do on the ward, I couldn't leave without helping her. I sat down on the side of her bed and started to feed her, despite her half protest that she would be fine on her own. That's when my perfectly white sleeve dipped right into the carrot soup giving me my very first stain. I learned a lot about medical management that month, as Mrs. G decided she didn't like the palliative care team very much and preferred that I act as a middleman when it came to planning her final days. What I learned about even more, however, was what it is to practice medicine and what it is to be a healer. Even though there was absolutely nothing I could do that would ever solve her physical ailments, I was able to provide her comfort just by being there. The few extra minutes I made sure to spend with her each day lifted her mood during such a difficult time, and I know that she appreciated it. I enjoyed the time we spent together too. She was much more than just an illness to me. She was a person, and she was my patient. She died on the last day of my rotation. I went home and cried. My coat wasn't pristine anymore, and neither was I. For the first real time, for the first for the very first time, I had experienced the joy and pain involved with caring for others. We've all been given a gift, the opportunity to help others in ways that most others will never be able to do. And many days, that gift provides us with great joy. Other days, it leaves us filled with sorrow. We can't fix everyone, and I don't think that's the point of what we're doing here. Physicianship has many def different definitions, and we're lucky to have it as part of our training here at McGill. That day, I learned what physicianship meant to me. Even though our coats are short as student physicians, it doesn't mean that we can't and won't still have a major impact on the life of our patients. There is so much more than the medicine we learn in textbooks when it comes to being a healer. You have to respect, acknowledge, and honor every single life. 
Whenever you meet a patient, you're being invited into a special relationship, one that includes the opportunity to serve, to share in pain as well as joy, and to rejoice in the triumph of the human spirit over the physical and mental limitations that we all possess. Never doubt that you can make a difference and never hesitate to try. You are about to receive your white coat. I have confidence that you are all ready to grow into it. Now, not all stains are sad, my dear colleagues. Let me end by telling you the story of my most recent stain, which I acquired while working an overnight shift in the emergency room a little last week. <laughs> an older gentleman was brought in at around 3 a.m. having fallen down a flight of stairs. Thankfully, he was mostly okay. He had managed to walk away from the incident relatively unscathed. He did, however, have a very large laceration on his scalp, one which took me three hours and almost 100 stitches to close up. When you spend that long next to someone's head, you sure do learn a lot about them. Whereas when I first met him, I only knew his last name. By the end of that shift, I can name all his children, tell you how many grandchildren he had, and I even got some really great book suggestions from his list of personal favorites. <laughs> Three hours of suturing can be exhausting, though, so when I was done, I was more than happy to take a breather. One of the staff had brought a box of donuts earlier in the night, so I excitedly grabbed a big chocolate glazed reward for myself. Just as I was bringing the sugary goodness to my mouth, my arm muscles finally decided to give out after the work I, workout I had put them through, and the next thing I knew, my, I knew my donut was on my white coat, chocolate glazed down. <laughs> of course. What can I say? Just another stain to add to my ever-growing collection. So, dear class of 2018, I wish you many things as you embark on your clerkship journey. I wish you luck, I wish you strength, and I wish you perseverance. But most of all, I wish that all of your coats get as dirty, stained, and creased as mine. Thank you. Nous allons maintenant commencer avec la remise des soro blancs. Uh, les étudiants seront assistés avec les soro par Dr. Namta Gupta, vice-doyenne adjointe pour le Bureau des Affaires étudiants, et par Dr. Barry Slapkoff, directeur du programme de l'apprenti médecin. We will now proceed to the donning of the white coats. You will be helped on with your coats by Dr. Namta Gupta, Assistant Dean of Student Affairs for the Faculty of Medicine, and by Dr. Barry Slapkoff, Director of the Physician Apprenticeship Program. I would ask the students to please get ready at the uh, front of the room for your name to be called so that you can come up immediately, and we'll call students up two at, a, two at a time to receive their coats. I would ask the audience to please hold your applause until all the students have received their coats. S'il vous plaît, gardez vos applaudissements jusqu'à ce que tous les étudiants aient reçu leur, leur cerveau. What are we doing on the screen? Okay. All right. Matthew Addis, Abrar Al Jassim. Isabella Albanese, James Alexander, Fares Antaki, Saba Balvardi. Luke Beaton, Wasim Bedruni, Benjamin Belin, <laughs> Nick.
Natan Ben Susan. Ella Benzaquen. Gabrielle Berardelli. Amar Bindi. Mathieu, Mathieu Blouin. Beatrice Bouchard. Kendra Bradshaw. Claudel Bro. Allison Brebner. And Sarah Briand. Audrey Brochu. Haley Butcher. Marie-Lou Caron Quentin. Thierry Chalifour. <laughs> Kelly Chang. Arzu Chowdhury. Pascal Chavanez. Bing Yu Chen. Wen Yu Chen. Minji Cho. Marco Cipolla, Wesley Cote, Tysa Cotton, Felix Couture, Amélie Sear. Janelle Sear. David Darienzo. Christian Dabrowski. Andre Dan. Benedict Dancero, Emily Daoud, Corrado De Marco, <laughs> Avina De Simone, <laughs> Emily Dean. Jin Deli Hussein. <laughs> Corey Demir. Nadine Demko. Xavier Deschen Simard. 
Massimo Diorio. Alexandra de Lizarro. Pierre Luc Dussault, Brittany Elliott. Nicruz Farsad, Mame Fay, Rachel Fernandez, Marie-Ève Fissé Morissette. Alexandra Fletcher. <laughs> Martin Fogel. Christopher Forrest. Russell Frank. David Galliano, Laurence Gariepi Assel, Charles Gelina, Laurence Genet. Artin Gassemian. Amanda Gibbs. David Giroux. <laughs> Julian Gittleman. <laughs> Harry Glickman. Katrina Gong. Yeah. <laughs> Ying Jia Gong. Jordan Gornitsky. Kevin Gorski. <laughs> Carl Grenier. <laughs> Jonathan Grill. Elin Guan. Yang Guo. David Haile Miscali. Dulia Hamad. <laughs> Farnoosh Harandian. Lee Harrell Sterling. Ryan Hartley. Kimia Hassani Ardakani. Shia Ji Hei.
Veronica Eber Murakami. <laughs> Next year we'll give instructions on how to get off the stage. <laughs> Valerie Henderson. Megan Helen Henderson Berg. Charles Haswani. Emily Hodgson. Michael Holmesy. Bill Huang. Lilia Isachenko. Igor Ivanecki. Wu Jin Kim. Mary Koziol. Emily L. Aubin. Alexandre Lafontaine. Mathilde Labbé. Florence Lamarche, Aurélie Larocque, Andrian Leblanc, Angela Lee, Stephanie Lenay, Jake Levy, <coughs> Jessica Lee, Maria Lopez Laporte. Joshua Lubov, Kate McNaughton, Aaron Mannard, Audrey Marcotte, Jacqueline Markovitz, Anael Massonet, Mohamed Matut, Jassy Meng. Marian Moalim Noor, <coughs> Sophia Mondestin, <coughs> Jong Yun Moon, <coughs> 
Joshua Morse. Guillaume Mali, Simon Nepveux, Marie Noël Nguyen, Thomas Nodzinski. Collins Auger, <laughs> Marcus Ozenbrug, Catherine Willette. Susie Willette, Sarah Usalem, Sarah Palotta, Sarah Pankovich, Marley Parsons. Daniel Peretz, Donovan Pham, Shamira Pira, <laughs> Emily Poitou. Vanessa Polito, Vera Pravong Vien Kem, Jake Prillo, Nora Purcell. Danica Quickfall, Amal Rout, Isabelle Richard, Samantha Rivet. Frank Rizko, Jean-Baptiste Roberge, Petros Rugas, Julien Rousseau, Tyler Safran, Kapil Serene Khanna, <laughs> Mark Sasson, Amanda Siegel.
Trevor Simplonius. Ivan Sirwada. Sanhita Srivastava. Gregory Sigler. Anne Sophie Smilga, Nicola Smith, Gabriel Souza, David Spillane. Alexandre saint onge saint hilaire Kyle Saint-Louis. Anna Stoika. Justin Taba. And so Justin is being helped on. <laughs> Justin's been helped on by his white coat by Dr. April Shammy, uh, who is obviously his mother. <laughs> <laughs> and an Oster Fellow for the class of 2018, and a classmate of mine from the bad class of uh, 1985. <laughs> Karen Tam. Jimmy Tat, <laughs> Cassandra Tetu, Sarah Tomaszewski. Azra Tube, Lahud Tuma, <coughs> Caroline Tremblay, Miguel Trottier. Yashita Upadhyaya, Esther Vogon, <laughs> Alexis Daniel Vigneault, Mohammed Amer Wali. Sharon Wang, <laughs> Sunny Wei, <laughs> Lauren, <coughs> Lauren Weisblatt, sorry. <coughs> sorry about that. Mark Wu. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, Marsha Weisot. Yasi Xiao.
Ping Sing Si. Ju Yin Su. Adrian Yak, Louis Yang, <laughs> Jia Wei Yu, Sandoz Zayed. Sophie Zhu, <clears throat> I, would, I think just stay here for a second. I think now we can applaud. To stand up. And because you can never have enough, of, enough Osler, students will receive a gift of two Osler books from the faculty, A Way of Life by William Osler, and Sir William Osler, A Selection for Medical Students. And the books will be available from the faculty office at a later date, and you have to read your email to uh, know when to pick it up. <laughs> J'invite uh, Mary Coziol à donner l'allocution de présidente de la classe et d'assister la classe avec le serment de la promotion 2018. I would ask Mary Coziol, president of the class of 2018, to address her class and to lead the class in their class pr pledge. On behalf of the class of 2018, welcome. We want to thank all involved in making today possible. Many thanks to the faculty and all of the organizers for orchestrating such a distinguished event. Thank you to Dr. Danielle Offrey, who happens to be one of my favorite medical storytellers. Your words are always thought-provoking, insightful, and richly human. To Melanie for reminding us of why we're here. Thank you to our Osler Fellows for their guidance and investment in us. And finally, thank you to all of our families, friends, and loved ones for their presence and ongoing support. That includes those who are unable to make it today but are maybe joining us via the webcast, as well as those who are no longer with us but whose presence is felt just as strongly. There have been a number of times in the past year that I have felt particularly proud of this class. Perhaps what has most stood out to me is the spirit of collaboration and camaraderie amongst us the multifold ways in which we have supported and strengthened each other to overcome our shared obstacles. In improving ourselves, we stand to benefit our future patients. But in contributing to our collective improvement, we stand to benefit entire communities, including the scientific and medical institutions that underpin them. I'm continuously grateful to be embedded in a learning community where each member has something so valuable to offer. I look forward to the next three years and to the deeply transformational, though at times painful, growth we will undergo by each other's sides. Today is a defining moment in our personal and our professional lives. 
we have a rare opportunity to reflect, to consider the values that have brought us here, to celebrate the people who have made it possible, and to articulate a shared vision for the impact we hope to have as individuals and collectively as the class of 2018. We have been afforded many privileges in pursuing this profession. And in recognition of our roles and our responsibilities, we pledge the following. In French first. Nous nous engageons à nous consacrer à l'exercice de la médecine, unique à la fois en tant qu'art et en tant que science, en cultivant notre volonté d'améliorer la vie d'autrui à reconnaître que nous soignerons des gens de tous les coins du monde ayant des idées diverses et à adapter notre pratique en conséquence, à promouvoir la santé de tous en mettant à profit notre rôle unique au sein de la société, à remettre en question nos préjugés et idées reçues cherchant à rendre notre pratique sûre et accessible à toujours viser l'excellence, sans jamais oublier que la médecine est une science humaniste. Nous apprendrons de nos erreurs et serons ouverts au changement, à apprendre tant que les autres apprennent de nous et à enseigner tel que nous aimerions que l'on nous enseigne, à collaborer avec chaque membre de notre communauté de soins de santé et à reconnaître la valeur des diverses formes d'expertise à promettre à nos proches que peu importe nos obligations professionnelles, nous serons présents pour eux tels que le sont et l'ont toujours été pour nous, à nous rappeler que nos patients figurent parmi nos plus grands éducateurs et sont les experts de leur propre expérience, à faire de notre propre bien-être une priorité au fondement même de la qualité de nos soins. En reconnaissance de l'engagement que nous avons pris aujourd'hui, nous acceptons avec humilité notre sort au blanc et toutes les obligations qui l'accompagnent. We pledge to dedicate ourselves to the practice of medicine, unique both as an art and a science, with a commitment to improve the lives of others to acknowledge that our practices will be frequented by people and ideas from divergent corners of the world, and to adapt our practices accordingly. To advocate for the health of all through our unique role in society. To challenge our own biases and assumptions, seeking to make our practices both safe and accessible. To continually strive for excellence while recognizing that medicine is a humanistic science, we shall learn from our mistakes and embrace change. To learn as we would like others to learn from us and to teach as we would like to be taught. To collaborate with every member of our healthcare community and acknowledge diverse forms of expertise. To promise our loved ones that no matter our professional duties, we will be present for them just as they are and have always been for us. To remember that our patients are among our most important teachers and the experts of their own experience. To prioritize our own wellness as a foundation for good patient care. In acknowledgement of the pledge that we have made today, we humbly accept our white coats and the obligations that lie therein. Congratulations, class of 2018. Merci à tous qui a assisté aujourd'hui à cette cérémonie. Thank you to everyone who has come today. A special thank you to the entire undergraduate medical education administrative staff who made this morning possible, to the Faculty of Medicine's University Advancement, who funded the White Coats and this event, and in particular to the main organizers, Anne Briggs and Caroline Cichon from Physicianship, Savannah Delola Student Records, and Leo Titero and Maya Zaremba from Special Events. And they're all huddled in the far corner.
You are invited to join us for a reception and celebration of our students. J'aimerais vous inviter à une réception pour nos étudiants et leurs familles. And finally, in the words of Barry Slapkoff, Director of Physician Apprenticeship, enjoy the day and with humility, take pride in your accomplishments. Congratulations, Felicitations.